Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing great. Welcome to the next session of your strategic business leader. Today, we are going to literally start off with the syllabus because yesterday's session was all about getting to know more about the subject itself, the exam, the HCA pattern, the resources which are available for you to practice towards your SBL paper. So before I start off with the first chapter, which is talking about leadership, let me know if you have absolutely any queries so far. Very quickly, please let me know if you have any queries or are we good to go ahead? I would either need a query or I would need a good to go ahead sign from you. So very quickly, please, everyone. Okay, so that's wonderful to read. Great. So let's start off with the chapter. Chapter number two from your ACCA study hub. Chapter number one, content wise, technically. Okay, so here we're going to talk about all about leadership. Now, why are we talking about leadership to begin with? The topic or the subject's name is strategic business leader, right? So obviously, the first thing you need to understand is the dynamics of leadership, the dynamics of strategy, the more important parameters that impact strategy. How about, you know, culture that impacts strategic decisions being taken? How about culture that impacts your um, leadership style as well, as well as the very important ethical as well as professional guidance and qualities that every leader must possess in order to become an effective leader. So we're going to have a look at this entire chapter today. This is just a quick overview of the chapter. I'm going to start off with the first topic. Okay, so now what we are talking about here in terms of leadership is who are the leaders of the organization? Tell me, who do you reckon are the leaders of the organization? It's not a political party that it requires leadership, right? But every organization to be successful requires effective leadership. So what do you understand by the term leadership? Tell me, who are the leaders of the organization? The chairman, the CEO, the board, the managers. Yes, it is the entire management who are the leaders of the organization, who lead the organization towards successful achievement of the mission, as well as the vision of the organization. So leaders are right at the top. They are the ones who are going to set the tone from the top in terms of what is it, you know, that they, they aspire from the organization. What is the overall corporate as well as cultural values of the organization. So everything in terms of, you know, which direction the organization is going, how that direction is being taken, what strategic routes the organization is picking up, everything will be done by the leadership itself. So there you are. We talk about leadership. Leadership is a theme that arises in many other areas of SBL. And obviously, we will be doing it across the entire syllabus area because that is what we are grooming here you to become. We are grooming here you to become a strategic business leader. So definitely, all the aspects of the entire content of the entire syllabus are going to groom you towards your leadership skills itself. Okay, so let's quickly have a look at the various aspects of a strategic leader per se. So leader, who is a leader? Leader is someone who is obviously in command, has, and even if, you know, sometimes the leader is not in command officially, but has the skill set for people. So all your influencers, your, you know, influencers, they are also leaders. Why? Because anybody who has followers, anybody who has the quality on the basis of which people are following their traits, what they are saying becomes a leader per se. Even though that officially they may or may not be designated as a leader. So leader clearly is someone who exercises influence over other people. Now in an organization, whenever we are talking about like strategic management per se, the role of a leader will obviously include setting the overall 
dynamics of the organization in terms of the mission and the vision that the organization stands for in terms of the objectives of the organization that you know the organization wants to achieve in the long run in terms of determining the overall structure the overall systems and controls in the organization the overall culture in the organization the overall uh, measures in which you know you will be monitored and controlled and overviewed in terms of being able to achieve the organization's success so all of these are your roles and responsibilities of a strategic leader per se just highlighting all the important key words here what do you understand by mission what do you understand by mission and vision of an organization any idea if you've done basic business studies at any point of time i'm sure you've heard of the term mission and vision so quickly let me know okay so let's have a look uh mission is short term vision is long term um no not really i wouldn't say so mission is something that you know the purpose of which you exist basically so it is something the most important parameter of your existence as an organization so the overriding purpose of the organization itself is called a overall long term mission of the organization whereas a vision is something that you know you are breaking it down in terms of okay this is where we want to be in the next 5 years so that's your vision for the organization so it is something which you are taking down further in terms of more achievable goals per se right so mission is the overriding purpose of the organization whereas vision is the desired future state of the organization so you can break it down in terms of your um, uh, time frame as well really right okay so now we are talking about an effective leader uh, can you give me few examples of good or you can say effective leaders be it in business be it in politics politics but yes people whom you recognize or resonate with as somebody who is an effective leader tell me any names that come up narendra modi absolutely yes what else i mean give me a few more examples of uh, good strong leaders that you can think of effective leaders that you can think of ratan tata absolutely yes elon musk yes absolutely that's absolutely right any other examples you can think of martin luther king ambani yes so yes why are we calling these people leaders if i look at them if i try and evaluate their personalities or their you can say skills or their traits do we find something common in all of these people all of these great leaders that you've identified any common traits or any common skills that you're able to identify in them tell me anything that you can think of any common uh, parameters that you can think of in in good effective leaders provide direction inspiration courage passion yes absolutely right so leadership skills yes akash but what kind of leadership skills what do you like what do you characterize as a leadership skill that's exactly what i want to ask so somebody who is uh, you know and uh, somebody who has the power to influence other people so is influential somebody who is persuasive somebody who has a good social uh you can say you know social iq level somebody who is um, liked and loved somebody who is clever maybe somebody who is fearless yes somebody who is assertive somebody who at the same time is a good listener also somebody who takes decisions but is all is all is all also uh, cooperative or dependable you can say right they essentially nurture strength and talent of his followers yes so somebody who inspires who has the ability to be able to inspire other people to follow him to be like him to to obey what he is saying to you know to confide in them right so on your screen is are a few traits and skills that we have jotted down 
which are considered as your common characteristics of your strategic business leaders. So quickly have a look and ask if you have any doubts in the list. Quickly have a look, ask if you're not able to understand any of these traits or skills. And, you know, why do you think that, you know, we are calling it as, a, as something which is essential for you to be called as an effective leader. So take any of the leaders that you've identified and just link that, okay, uh, does this, does Narendra Modi, uh, you know, uh, characterize as somebody who's adaptable to situations? Is he somebody who's alert to the entire social and economic environment in which he's operating? Is he someone who is obviously ambitious and wants, you know, uh, his goals and his missions and his visions to be achieved, really? Is he someone who has the power to be assertive? Assertive in a way that, you know, he, com he can command. At the same time, get people to follow him. So get that cooperation out of people. So just review the entire list, keeping any of the leaders that, you know, you are thinking of in mind. The skill set or the traits a lot of them you would find as something, something that you can actually adapt to these leaders so that, you know, you will resonate with these leaders, basically. So quickly have a look at this list. Ask if you have any doubts in the list. So that's wonderful that everybody's read through it and there are no doubts. So now if I actually like kind of kind of try to categorize it apart from this list here. So I'm just going to highlight this list here because these are some of the common traits and skills you can commonly identify in all the leaders. Uh, yes, Anand, please ask. Please ask. We are also going to have a look at uh, some primary bifurcation of the skill set of effective leaders. So definitely they have emotional stability as well as composure in terms of, you know, you would never find a leader literally, you know, losing their patience or doing some erratic stuff. They, if they make mistakes, a good leader will always, always admit their mistakes as well. They will definitely have great interpersonal skills. They, because of these great interpersonal skills, they have followers. There are people who follow them because they have they've been able to create that bond with their followers, as well as they definitely are strong people, intellectual people. They are uh, knowledgeable people. So we definitely are being able to call them as a good common set with all of these. Traits. Okay, so are the points on the screen from the BPP workbook? So Anand, I am teaching from the ACCA Study Hub, which is a free resource which is available to all ACCA students via their My ACCA account. So this is a free content available from ACCA and that's precisely I am teaching it from this content so that everybody has the same content and definitely because it's Directly from ACCH, so it's definitely exam standard as well. So it covers everything that you really need to know for your exam. Okay, so now if I talk about kinds of leadership, kinds of effective leadership, if I talk about. So again, you know, picking up from the examples that we have identified for effective leaders, we definitely are able to characterize our strong leaders into these effective categories. So a transformational leadership is what is an or transformational leadership to begin with. So you are a leader, an effective leader who is able to drive that transformation within the organization, drive that change within the organization and thus you are called a transformational leader because you are able to believe, get that de desired change within the organization. So supporters of transformational theories of the, uh, of the leadership always believe that yes, they are the ones who will be able to get that change done because they are the one who will be able to lead and people are going to follow what they are doing. This, this is a transformational leader. It's certainly someone 
who has the vision as well as the passion to be able to achieve something within a stipulated time frame so i want to do this in the next two years and i have that drive in me i have that you know that passion in me to be able to drive that change to be effective in the next two years as well the way to get things done is by injecting enthusiasm as well as energy throughout the organization so how how do you reckon you are going you are you are going to be able to get that transformational leadership done what are you going to do obviously the first thing is that you have to yourself understand and get a vision that this is what i want so you have to set yourself a vision a future state of mind and in a in a desired time frame that this is what i want to achieve in the next two years so i have to develop a vision for myself is the first thing and once i have that vision now i need to convince the people around me to join me in me being able to achieve that mission so you really have to convince and sell your vision to your followers so that they join hands with you and together as a team you are able to drive that transformation drive that change that you are aspiring for right does everybody agree upon this any doubts in transformational leader because i want you to have a look at an example of jeff bezos why are we calling him a transformational leader has he really been able to drive and bring about that transformational change in the journey of amazon very quickly have a look at the example please done reading everyone so do you believe and do you understand why we are calling jeff bezos as an example of a transformational leader right is ask if you have any doubts here okay so let's now have a look at the next example of effective leadership which we called an authentic leader now why are we calling someone an authentic leader authentic because of the of the of the faith that uh, this uh, this uh, male or female has been able to generate in the way they are operating so they definitely have a lot of public trust so there's a lot of uh, faith in terms of if if it is coming from this leader it is going to be true it is going to be effective it is going to be something that you know that you can resonate with has a lot of self awareness from the perspective that self aware that yes they know what they are talking about they are they agree upon what they are saying and definitely they practice what they preach as well they are able to deliver in the most toughest situation under a lot of pressure as well so that is what truly makes them stand out as an authentic leader any example you can think of any example of authentic leadership traits that you can think of there is a lot of public trust there is a lot of self awareness in terms of this is exactly what i'm trying to do and this is exactly what it requires me to do and definitely a lot of not just preaching but a lot of practice as well right quickly read through the example of ron conrad as uh, somebody who 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 we can we can consider as somebody who has become an authentic leader or any other example you can think of i can think of so many examples right now pm modi is also transformational yes absolutely right what about this one what about authentic leader you could consider steve jobs you could also consider leaders um i it comes to my mind that i could think of people like virat kohli to be somebody you know whom the who the general public has a trust on the 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 person himself knows that what requires to be done at what point of time sometimes may click sometimes doesn't click is another thing it's it's a it's a sport altogether right but yes generally the people perceive him as a as an authentic leader right quickly have a look at the example of 
Bjorn Conrad. Very quickly, please, guys. Absolutely. Quickly read through the example. Done reading, guys. So let's have a look at a very common, uh, you can say, you know, feature or trait that we find in all strategic business leaders is that they are able to grab opportunities. They are able to identify first and then they are also able to grab those opportunities. They are able to lead by example by taking in on that uh, new drive for something which is new, for something which is innovative. And because they are so driven on research and technology and bringing in something new, that is where their success mantra really lies because they are the ones who are basically innovating at all point of time. They are trying to identify what new positive opportunities the environment around them is able to bring across, which they can very quickly grab and probably you know, make the best out of it. So definitely one of the tasks of a strategic business leader is to lead innovations and identify new opportunities in your surroundings. So whenever I say innovation, I mean something which is, uh, you know, new from a perspective of be it, uh, be it uh, the, the system, the process, the service, the technology, but something which is a unique feature, some USP is there apart from what is already existing in the market. So you are able to invent new and new products. You are able to drive new and new changes. You are able to bring across that, that shake in the market that is required. Now, that innovation, that new product service may not always be something which gets, you know, wholeheartedly accepted by the consumer. But these leaders, these strategic business leaders at all point of times, they are still driven for newer, better technology. If I just give you a simple example, you look at the advertisement that Apple has been doing for their every iPhone every year. The best till date. The best till date. The best. Every year, they launch a new product with the same tagline. It's the best till date. It's the best thing in the market available. So what they are compressing is that whatever you have you know, being made available till now, we have brought in a newer a more innovative product in the market. And so it's the best in class. So it immediately, over the years, it has been able to define it in the consumer's mind that any new innovation, any new product that, you know, they launch is going to be a new innovative product. Now, sometimes we feel that, you know, that really that level of innovation is might not be so that you can literally call it as a new you know, version of the phone and charge an exorbitant amount of it. But yes, that, that perception they've been able to create in the market that if it's coming from them, it would be an innovative product. It would be the best in class available. It would be with something new thrown into the, probably the same package as well. But yes, that is the kind of marketing, that is the kind of uh, you know, perception they've been able to create in the market. Right? Quickly have a look at the example for Ford and Volkswagen, why they are considered the pioneer in innovation in the automobile industry. Very quickly have a look at the example. Apple Inc. is all about excellent storytelling. Absolutely. So even if it is not something which is like a real big, huge innovation, they will tell it as if it's like a, you know, a huge product, really. Uh, I am working in Muscat, Oman. So today is working day here. So I will take the balance uh, lecture as recorded. Absolutely no problem, Akash. You can definitely switch to the lectures on your own time zones as per your own comfort. I ideally would want a lot of, you know, maximum of you to join in life. But because of operational and, you know, reasons, which are beyond your control, then definitely please refer to the back. And the WhatsApp group is still going to be there where you can, you know, shout out for any uh, queries if you have. But just be regular and just be disciplined in your class. Okay, quickly read through the example, guys. Uh, 
Anand, it's 2 a.m. in America and you're studying. Oh my God, that, that really shows your, uh, your, you know, your drive to study. And I'm so proud that you're my student. That's just amazing. Okay, so now let's have a look at whenever I'm talking about, you know, a new opportunity coming into the market and we feel that, you know, you really need to have that, that skill of being able to grab at that opportunity by bringing in something new, by bringing in something innovative into the market. And that could be a success mantra. At the same time, to be able to bring and to be able to take advantage of that innovation and that, you know, new opportunity that the market has thrown that that has you know come up in the market in the uh, macroeconomic environment that we operate we really need to have that entrepreneurial skill that entrepreneurial uh, you know quality in ourselves to be able to get up and grab it as an opportunity so if i talk about it see covid when it hit the you know the the world it obviously you know uh, brought across a lot of uh, um, uh, human damage per se but at the same time it did bring across a lot of newer opportunities for businesses to grow for enterprise to grow you know, there were so many you know uh, new ways in which businesses started uh, you know uh, operating there were so new ways in which new businesses new business ideas actually came into the picture and that is what is the skill of entrepreneurship so now any idea what do you understand by the term entrepreneurship? Any idea? So I here, you know, came in COVID and we realized that, you know, it's it's not safe to for us to, you know, be traveling uh, so much around. If I would rather just, you know, get a, a delivery made at home. That led to a little lot of online delivery partners booming into the picture. So, you know, in came in Blinkit, Zepto, uh, 10 minutes delivery by a big basket. A lot of players adapted to this new business opportunity that had come in. And they showed that entrepreneurial skills to be able to deliver and serve that new opportunity that the market has. You know, that the market has really shown, that the market has really, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, is bringing into the picture. So that is what is called your entrepreneurial quality. So when I talk about this entrepreneurial life cycle, let's take the example of any, any startup. Any startup you want to suggest? Any startup that you want me to correlate to? COVID brought new business avenues. I was involved and one in India which is doing well. Yes, absolutely, yes. There were uh, a lot of opportunities that the market has brought across. So what is, what is entrepreneurial life cycle? What do you understand by the idea of entrepreneurial life cycle? So let's take the example of, uh, say, Blinkit as an example. So we are talking about uh, an online venture, which is uh, which is which has got made its own warehouses, and it's it's delivered at your doorsteps within a time frame of eight to ten minutes. So this entrepreneur, please refer Club uh, Suleimani from seven employees, two hundred sixteen three years. Yes, absolutely. So there are so many examples of great enterprises that have, you know, that have uh, come up, uh, you know, that great uh, entrepreneurial uh, business ventures that have come up because of COVID, during COVID. And they are, they are huge businesses today. They are huge, successful business ventures today. So definitely, as soon as you start a new enterprise, the first thing that is going to happen is going to be a startup. So you begin with 
something which is called a startup phase wherein the only objective here at this point of time is to be able to survive and grow in the market you know make yourself felt and heard and you know your presence being felt into the market so here at the startup stage you need money money to be invested by your you know by the entrepreneur himself or herself or by venture capitalists pumping in money into your new business idea or your startup idea if they are convinced with with what your business idea really is obviously which time will kick in growth which time you know after you grown to your highest stage really you will reach your peak level which would be called the maturity phase and after the maturity phase every business for that matter you know faces a a natural exit or a natural you can say a uh, decline phase in terms of from where it is to where it wants to be so entrepreneurial life cycle definitely has its four stages the startup stage the growth stage it's like any other business life cycle it will have its stages in terms of from where it started to where it is going to be quickly read through it and i want you to tell me the advantages and disadvantages of you know starting maybe a new business i was able to spin this out similar to product life cycle yes absolutely right so tell me any any advantages that you can think of so if tomorrow you have a great business idea you identify that there is a new business opportunity you know um, coming up in the market and you want to invest in your startup idea what do you think you know you obviously are going to do like a cost benefit analysis an advantage disadvantage chart you should prepare in terms of is it something that you know i really want to uh, invest all my savings in or i want to take the risk so tell me any advantages of entrepreneurship or the drawbacks of entrepreneurship that you are able to you know identify tell me what about the advantages and disadvantages come on you should be able to tell me this it's pretty simple it's pretty generic and i am not the one who is going to be all all the time talking in the class it has to be you too any idea of advantages any idea of disadvantages that you can think of what if it's not a success all your money is going to go down the drain right what if you know um, you thought that there is a possible demand or probable demand in the market but that idea really did not click in the market so there is like eventually when you make you made the product and launched the product there was like no demand for it you thought there is a market but it did not turn out to be that market really or that market was not so huge really and what else definitely Uh, you know we always say that uh, uh, people who are doing jobs is in a nine to five job but job but people who are running their own business their own enterprise it's like a twenty four seven job that they are doing so it definitely comes with it a lot of stress a lot of uh, you can say um, you know commitment that it brings across and advantages definitely includes the fact that uh, you know it's something that you're working towards it's like your own baby. so that level of motivation that level of passion that you have for that idea is obviously going to be at the greatest of all heights and um, uh, sometimes you know uh, if it's not if it's it in a, in a in a sometimes in a particular business setup we feel that an entrepreneur they are they are much sorted because they can make quicker decisions they can make uh, faster decisions and grab much more opportunities than probably a big scale business why because there is there is no you know a uh, bureaucracy in in such businesses creative freedom to experiment with new ideas and opportunities to gain a thorough understanding of the business is definitely there as well right so they are motivated and they will put everything that they have for their business because it brings them great 
personal satisfaction per se. It is free from bureaucracies, so it's quick to make decisions, and definitely there is a lot of creative freedom which your own business brings to you. Now that could, on the flip side, result into a cash burn and a business failure, or nobody, you know, the product that you've made, nobody really wants to buy, and definitely it's. Huge commitment and very stressful as well. I'm just highlighting the key points here, guys. So you're all able to identify and, uh, you know, recall the quick points. Advantages include success, financial success, growth, innovative uh, outsuits as well, economic development. Disadvantage includes you probably... Uh, you're trying to probably do everything on your own without having the requisite skill set. Yes, that's a good disadvantage there. And there's a lot of dog work, say, says Anand. So yes, because it's your business. So everything that goes in and around the business is your responsibility. It's not like a job wherein you have a fixed KRA. Because it's your business, ultimately everything becomes your KRA. Right? Okay. And then we have the concept of intrapreneurship. Anybody has ever heard of the word intrapreneur? So I am working for an organization. But within myself, I have those, you know, entrepreneurial skills, that flamboyance, that our creative mind. So I am doing and applying that, that principle of entrepreneurial skills within the organization which I am working for. That then is called intrapreneurship. So you're not operating, you're not establishing an organization for yourself separately to run as a business leader. But within your existing company, you're able to, you know, inculcate that uh, that spirit, that uh, that strong minded, that startup style management style to bring in a lot of innovation within your company. So you're give, uh, it's it's a lot of let go of you know how you want to really take your uh, business ahead so that is what is called an entrepreneurial style of leadership quickly go through the example here i want you to go through the example of an entrepreneur and then we'll open up the exhibit quickly go through the example first guys yes that's right so quickly go through the example Done reading. So quickly have a look at exhibit one, wherein we are talking about Alpha Alphabet Inc. Any idea what is Alphabet Inc? So we're talking about Google here, right? So Google invests huge amounts in startups. The following extract from a letter to the shareholder of Alphabet explains the importance of the company of new innovation and the entrepreneurial spirit of the company. Google is not a conventional company. We do not intend to become one. So this is actually a very strong line that they don't want to, they don't intend to become a conventional company as well. From the start, we've always tried for to do more, to do more important and meaningful things with the resources we have. So that clearly says that, you know, their, their drive, their, their passion itself at all times is to, to, to do something which is up and beyond what any conventional, you know, think or any conventional way of looking at things might be like. From the start, we've always tried to do more and to do important and meaningful things with the resources we have. We did a lot of things that seemed crazy at the time, many of those crazy things now have over a billion users. Google Maps, YouTube, Chrome, Android, all these things, obviously, you know, at the start, people, you know, might have thought that they are crazy, but we were always super excited about these things. And because they've always wanted to do something like this, that is what their entrepreneurial drive is all about. And that's why they've been able to, you know, bring in, 
more and more entrepreneurs within the organization that have driven this business to this height that which it is at today right yes absolutely so quickly i want you to read through the advantages and disadvantages of the same it's very simple but quickly read through it Okay with everyone? Okay, so now let's start more and understand more about ethical and professional qualities which every business leader needs to imbibe. And you cannot move forward without linking the concept of governance with leadership. What is governance basically? Governance is the way in which organizations are managed and controlled. It is a way in which businesses are operating, the way in which they drive their key ethical as well as professional values within the organization. So governance is the system by which organizations are managed and controlled. So we look at it in terms of how you are able to, you know, how leaders are able to, to drive governance within the organization making it top priority that this is the way this particular this particular business is going to be run so that is why we say that governance good governance and leadership goes hand in hand yes absolutely right so how things are going to be done so that entire management and control is called governance so these are the quick underpinning concepts of the concept of corporate governance as we call it. I want you all to now quickly just have a look at a quick introductory video on corporate governance. I'm just going to show you a quick introductory video on corporate governance. I don't want to show you anything which is boring, but just a quick and a good one, really. <laughs> Let me show you quick, small videos. Dark spots ko raste se hatao. New L'Oreal Paris Glycolic Bright Serum. Inspired by peeling procedures. Validated with dermatologists. Penetrates fast to visibly reduce dark spots in two weeks. For even beaming skin. New L'Oreal Paris Glycolic Bright Serum. We are worth it. Corporate governance states the set of principles, processes, and systems that regulate the company. On the basis, these principles, processes, and guidelines company directs and controls the decisions to fulfill its goals and objectives. It helps to add value to the company and proves beneficial for all the stakeholders in the long term. Good corporate governance focuses on conducting the business with all integrity, fairness, and being as transparent as possible regarding all the transactions. Corporate governance is a dynamic practice consisting of internal control provisions and procedures to manage a company. It affects and gets affected by a number of factors. These factors can range from internal to external factors such as shareholders' activism, a threat of hostile takeover, and prevailing legal environment. The company must have the most effective governance to retain these stakeholders and have their confidence. Your company must be able to understand the requirements of various stakeholders so that you can address them in the best way possible. If the company has good corporate governance, it leads to corporate progress and economic growth. 
It also helps in raising the capital efficiency and be effective in its corporate matters. It ensures a lot of saving by lowering the capital cost and it leads to a positive impact. Thank you so much. And uh, regarding the ads, don't worry. I have a YouTube premium account. I just need to log in from that account. So don't worry. You will not be able to see the advertisements from next time. But I just need to log in from that account. Um, okay. Let me just show you one more. Which basically discusses the entire framework. This is a good one. So let me just show this to you. Okay, there you are. Corporate governance. Corporate governance is a set of rules, practices, and processes by which a firm is directed and controlled. Communicating a firm's corporate governance is a key component of community and investor relations. It involves balancing the interests of a company's many stakeholders, such as shareholders, management, customers, suppliers, financiers, government, and the community. Good corporate governance creates a transparent set of rules and controls in which shareholders, directors, and officers have aligned incentives. Sorry guys, I'm not going to show you this one. I don't like it. Do you want to work at big shot companies like Deloitte, Accenture, Amazon, Infosys, TCS, Capgemini, HCL, Wipro, Cognizant and many more and all Chapter 1. Corporate Governance Concepts. The Basics of Corporate Governance. Let's take a look at some important questions regarding corporate governance. We will start with, what is corporate governance? There are many definitions aimed at encapsulating the spirit of corporate governance. Corporate governance is simply described as the process by which organizations are directed and controlled in terms of authority, accountability, stewardship, leadership, direction, and control. Corporate governance is more comprehensively described as the framework by which a company's board of directors and senior management establishes and pursues objectives while providing effective separation of ownership and control. It includes the establishment and maintenance of independent validation mechanisms within the organization that ensure the reliability of the system of controls used by the board of directors to monitor compliance with adopted strategies and risk tolerances. Why is corporate governance important? The implementation and maintenance of strong corporate governance policies ensure that proper oversight is in place to hold the organization accountable to the standards, laws, and regulations that it should be abiding by. Effective corporate governance helps an organization to achieve its objectives and desired outcomes and fulfill its obligations through sound strategic and business planning, risk management, financial management and reporting, human resource planning and control, and compliance and accountability systems. Effective governance also helps provide a framework for establishing responsibility to all of the participants connected to the organization spanning clients, employees, and providers of capital. An effective corporate governance framework is essential to a banking organization's overall safety and soundness. How is corporate governance assessed? Assessing corporate governance can be classified into four general topic areas, structure effectiveness, board supervision adequacy, management effectiveness, and adequacy of control functions. A three-tiered rating system of strong, adequate or weak is commonly used to summarize the results of an assessment. A review of structure effectiveness targets the organizational structure through a top-down review of legal entities, individuals, and policies. More specifically, it focuses on how clearly roles, responsibilities, and lines of authority, as well as communication channels, 
are reflected in the legal structure of the institution. In addition, it considers the quality of the ethics policy and the code of employee conduct established by the board to guide the actions of management and employees on behalf of the institution. A review of the adequacy of board supervision focuses on elements that demonstrate the ability of board members to understand and oversee the activities of the organization. Board charters are reviewed to understand the legal requirements that are established for the board by the shareholders. The assessment of board committees focuses on how committees are structured, the quality of minutes, and most importantly, the quality, frequency, and timeliness of information flow to the full board. Given the importance, additional attention is placed on the activities of the audit and governance committees. The evaluation of board supervision adequacy also considers board members and their qualifications, the reasonableness of compensation practices, the quality and accuracy of board minutes and reporting, and the adequacy and frequency of training and self-assessments. And finally, a thorough review will focus on board member attendance. Evaluation of management effectiveness centers on management committee charters and activities and line of business metrics. In particular, the review of this area focuses on the qualifications of committee members, the scope of committee activities, and the flow of information to the board. Line of business management through self-assessments and other reporting systems can provide useful information to the board of directors regarding risk profile and valuable insight for setting strategy. So, for institutions managed by line of business, which are typically the more complex institutions, the quality of self-assessments was evaluated. As control functions provide an independent assessment of the quality of internal controls and risk levels, their effectiveness and relationship with the board is an important component of corporate governance. In this context, evaluation of the adequacy of control functions focuses on the efficacy of the internal audit, external audit, credit review, and compliance. A three-tiered rating system of strong, adequate, or weak is commonly used to summarize the results of an assessment. A strong rating reflects that for all or a significant majority of the characteristics reviewed for each element, the institution performed at the highest standards possible and no characteristics were rated weak. An adequate rating reflects an institution generally meeting expectations for each element, but could have anywhere from one to a few instances where individual characteristics did not meet expectations. These shortfalls could be easily addressed in the normal course of business and would not be significant enough to adversely affect any supervisory ratings. A weak rating reflects the institution had one or more characteristics where there were serious shortfalls in meeting minimum expectations. These shortfalls would require significant efforts to correct and could negatively affect an institution's supervisory rating. Now that we have answered some basic questions about corporate governance, let's take a look at the role that banks play in world economy. Okay, so that was just to bring you a heads up in terms of how across the globe every organization needs the underpinning concepts of corporate governance in order to align the way it which is getting you know it is getting controlled and it is getting supervised and it is getting it is getting your operations done basically to be able to lead to an effective manner so now these are the underpinning concepts of corporate governance all organizations by all means must operate in all fairness fairness to whom fairness to all stakeholders which means you cannot just ignore the minority stakeholders you have to give all stakeholders the requisite amount of information acknowledgement respect that they duly reserve including the minority stakeholder the shareholders openness and transparency in terms of its its operations in terms of actually displaying what is the true picture of the organization what is really 
you know the correct position of the organization so you have to at all times be transparent be open to all your stakeholders innovation every business to be successful to be continue to be successful requires to continually innovate its products services its operations its procedures so yes it's very important for organizations to be able to create that spirit of innovation within the within the organization to continue to foster growth within the business as well so definitely they must innovate and just not you know just just not repeat what you are already doing but instead do things in a more innovative manner then you have skepticism skepticism requires a questioning mind at all times skepticism is so important that it's even a professional skill that you need to inculcate as a strategic business leader so obviously as a business head you cannot go ahead without having a skeptical mind without questioning that is this the right thing is the, are these the right facts being stated or not so yes you definitely require skepticism as part of your good governance independence now why do i say that we need an organization to be able to operate and run and make its decisions independently because any idea why independence is it's given so much importance i'll give you a very simple example to help you understand this concept who are the owners of the organization tell me who are the owners of the organization tell me who are the owners of the organization everybody should know that who owns the organization the shareholders own the organization yes but who are operating the day to day decision making of the organization it is the directors of the organization who are acting as agents of the real owners who are the shareholders and thus that is why we say that independence is extremely important because the people who are running and managing the organization are different from the real owners of the organization so there comes in an agency gap so as a decision maker as a director i might be you know just driven to increase or uh, manage the organization or move the organization in a way which is towards my own personal benefit rather than and you know and overlooking the overall interest of the real owners of the organization who are the shareholders right thus we need to bring in independence independence in the form of independent non executive directors independence in the form of two strong pillars in the organization one acting as the ceo of the company and one acting as the chairman of the company so that you know these two powerful roles are not in the hands of one person we we cannot have unfettered power in the hands of one person we have to have an in an independent non executive chairman reviewing all the decisions that the ceo of the company is making to make sure that they are aligned with the overall objectives the mission and the vision of the shareholders of the organization why because these executive directors could very well you know start driving the business in their own personal benefits only and overseeing the overall benefit that the real owners of the company really want the shareholders of the company really want right so independence is extremely important we need to have independence in all of these criteria bring in uh you know separation of power between your executive and your non executive uh, executive and your chairman of the board bring in independent non executive directors bring in the use of internal and external auditors to report to the audit committee audit committee which is comprised of 100% nedes audit committees and limitation of non audit work so there are a lot of corporate governance rules and procedures that we will be studying here that all of that that all of that independence has been brought into the picture purely to remove this agency gap 
between the people who own the company, that is the shareholders, and the people who manage the company, that is the executive directors. Right? Is this okay with everyone? Yes, corporate governance socks is corporate governance. So your US driven corporate governance regime is called SOCs. However, here the ACC qualification is a UK based accounting qualification, which is a principles based approach of corporate governance. I will come to that as well, Anand. Right? But SOCs very well is corporate governance. The US, the rules based corporate governance regime. Okay, so we talk about honesty and probity at all times. The organization and its ways and processes and systems have to be honest. They have to operate with honor, with correct, fair dealing, and how they are going to not at any time mislead the stakeholders. Remember, the words we are using here is stakeholders, not just the shareholders, but people who are internally, externally connected with the organization. Everybody is included in this broader terminology called the stakeholders, right? Does everybody agree upon this? Quickly read through the example of Tesco. Quickly read through example number five, guys. Sure, Hush, probity simply means being honest. So as a leader, as a director of the company, you cannot go across and do something which is not correct, which is not the honest thing to do, which is not the fair thing to do, which is not uh, you know, something that uh, would be acceptable or considered in the best interest of the shareholders and the stakeholders of the organization. So at any point of time, simple example here is given, that you cannot window dress the accounts. Why? Because that is against the principle of probity and honesty. Right? Absolutely. So being truthful, being honest, being fair. Comes in next, the shared responsibility. What is responsibility? So yes, as a director, you have to accept that it is your responsibility. It is your, you know, whatever actions in direct, whatever decisions you are taking as an organization, whatever results are coming in, it is your duty to accept that responsibility and the repercussions of those responsibility. So responsibility is a willingness by the management to accept liability for the outcomes of governance decisions. So you are basically holding yourself responsible and hand in hand with responsibility comes in the concept of accountability, wherein you are taking any decisions and you are making yourself accountable for those decisions. You are considering yourself that, yes, this is what I, I know this is what a repercussion of my decisions. It is my duty as a director to be accountable for the, uh, the good, bad and ugly things that have happened in the organization. Right? So the duties of directors include accountability for performance, 
the relevance as well as reliability of corporate reports and integrity of the integrated reports as well. Integrated are joint reports. We'll come to that separately. Then at all times, judgment. Judgment has to be fair. Judgment has to be in the best interest of the stakeholders of the organization. So you have to thoroughly be able to understand the, the concepts, the responsibilities of the organization that how is it that we are going to activate, how is it that we are going to look into the management of the organization. So entities operate in a complex and diverse range of events, activities and, and environment, but they are going to at all times understand the implications that the managers have, a thorough understanding of the entity, its operations and necessary repercussions which is going to bring across. So whatever decisions I'm taking, I have to make sure that I understand the repercussions of this judgment that I am making. And I am holding myself responsible as well as accountable for these judgments as well and their repercussions as well. Right? Yes, absolutely. It comes with not just liability, it comes with responsibility and, and, and accountability. Quickly have a look at this quick example of what really went wrong in the Lehman Brothers. Quickly read through the example, guys. Done. So yes, at all times, the directors, the board of directors of the company cannot run away with their accountability for the decisions that they are taking. NEDs are non-executive directors. We, so the, the directors, the executive directors we have are the normal directors of the company. But we need to have independent non-executive directors in the organization to make sure that the decisions of the executive directors are in line with the corporate governance regime. On that note, I feel that, you know, you probably, a uh, few of you have a doubt in this as well. So what I will do, I will very quickly show you a quick difference between the executive and non-executive directors. Let's quickly have a look at this and what the non-executive directors actually do. I'll just look for a good small video to show you guys.
Yeah, this seems to be a good one. Let me just check once. In corporate governance, an independent director is a member of a board of directors who has no significant link with a firm and is not a member of its executive team or involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the company. A significant relationship is one that can impede a director's ability to exercise independent opinion. In summary, an independent director is a member of the board of directors who, one, has no material relationship with the company, two, is not a member of the company's executive team, and three, is not engaged in the day-to-day -day operations of the firm. Because they are not tied to the present management, an independent director refers to the board member rather than the organization. Their key responsibilities include setting the pay of senior CEOs, making corporate financial decisions based on sound judgment, playing an important role in resolving disputes between two parties, Role of independent director. Independent directors play roles. Take neutral decision. Use an unbiased judgment. Act as a middle person. Duties of independent director. Independent directors are compensated per sitting. The money is also quite good. So, in reality, shareholders are paying for professional guidance. They must always be up to date. They should continually improve their abilities, knowledge, and so forth. That is, to raise the alarm if he notices anything unethical, dishonest, or a corporate violation. He is constantly working for the stockholders and should remain so. They must meet separately, away from management, to discuss the company's present situation. They should not skip meetings since they help them understand the company from the inside out. As a result, they must attend the meetings. Independent versus non-executive director. A non-executive director is a director who is not employed by the organization. On the other hand, an independent director is not an employee of the organization but is subject to a number of additional criteria. They cannot, for example, own stock in the organization. Non-executive directors, on the other hand, are exempt from this restriction. So, while all independent directors are non-executive, they are not all distinct. Stock exchange requirement. The number of independent directors that must form the board varies depending on the stock market. The New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, for example, demands that independent directors constitute the majority of the board. The NYSE defines an independent director as someone with no materiality relationship with the business, while the NASDAQ defines a non-executive director as someone who has no relationship that would interfere with the exercise of independent judgment in carrying out director obligations. Advantages of appointing independent directors. Independent directors are often chosen for selection to boards of directors and are crucial to good corporate governance. A board that is majority independent would be better suited to oversee the CEO than a board comprised of dependent directors. Appointing more independent directors generally results in greater third-party advice and expertise. Since the directors, by definition, do not have a material relationship with the company, they are not subject to undue influence from the management team. With his knowledge and skill set gained over the years, he helps steer the company, serve as a go-between for shareholders and management, resolving disagreements keeps top-level executive pay in line with standard practices in the sector. It also serves as an external auditor, attempting to uncover any accounting wrongdoing. Disadvantages of appointing independent directors. One example is the risk of information asymmetry, as independent directors are generally less informed about the company than the management team. Independent directors may also not have the requisite skills and knowledge to be an effective board member. These directors are frequently seen serving on many boards. As a result, they lose efficiency since they do not have time to thoroughly comprehend the company's structure and so cannot make an educated choice. Internal management is better knowledgeable of the company's personnel and linked parties. As a result, if an independent director attempts to give judgment without appropriate awareness of the conditions, management will find it difficult to run the firm. In bad circumstances, these directors frequently resign because they do not want to be entangled in legal actions. Conclusion These are critical for every company. 
The board of directors makes the final decision. It takes both internal and external directors to strike the right balance and maximize shareholder value. As a result, they should do proper due diligence prior to the appointment. Right, so I hope this was useful. We is has this given you a good idea of non-executive directors? Wonderful. Okay. So Urban company one hour shine. Okay, so let's proceed then. I really need to log on to my premium account now. Okay. So next very important principle of corporate governance talks about integrity integrity which means that you need to do the right thing at the right time making sure that whatever you are presenting whatever decisions whatever results you are portraying are true and fair so it definitely implies fair dealing and truthfulness truthfulness in terms of reporting truthfulness in terms of giving away information which is the correct way in which it should be uh, it should be presented to the stakeholders of the organization as well. So it contains materially false or misleading statements. If it contains statements on information which has been provided recklessly or omits or obscures required information where such omission or absurdity would be misleading again, would be considered that it is something which goes behind or goes against the integrity of the organization reputation at all times you cannot disrepute bring any disrepute to the organization to the goodwill of the organization whatever decisions you are taking you have to show that you are the ones who are you're the face of the organization here right reputation risk is a business risk and definitely it is one of the most important risk that, you know, one of the most important assets of you as an organization. You would really not want to, um, you know, defame your organization really at any point of time. Quickly have a look at an example for Volkswagen that what really went behind in Volkswagen that, you know, brought across uh, this, this disrepute to the organization. Done reading, guys. Any doubts? Any doubts regarding the ethical and professional qualities which as a strategic business leader, as a board of director, you should be able to imbibe in your conduct in the organization. And all of these underpinning concepts are the driving factors of principles behind the concept of corporate governance. Right? Okay with everyone? Quickly ask if you have any doubts here.
is it okay with everyone can we now move on to the concept of culture and is it something that you think is important for an organization to look into as a strategic business leader should you be bothered about the organization's culture is it something which is actually pivotal for the success of the organization tell me what is culture really what do you understand by the term culture things which are considered normal things which are considered acceptable so you know something or a, a decision or the way in which you operate which is considered an okay way to operate that defines the culture of the organization culture is most important how we do what we do here in the organization yes absolutely at many point of time we see in the organization is that people look for changes in the organization because they are not happy with the organization's culture it is that important it is that pivotal for an organization and the strategic business leader to take care of because if your workforce is happy or is not happy is looking for a change everything gets determined by the overall culture of the organization and thus we must always strive as a strategic business leader to have a good healthy culture within the organization which promotes uh, you know well being which promotes a good healthy work life balance a culture which promotes uh, people and you know organizations and its employees to grow as an organization so the deeper level of basic assumptions and beliefs that are shared by members of an organization that operate unconsciously and define in a basic taken for granted fashion is what the organization's culture basically defines so basic assumptions basic beliefs that is shared within the organization and because it is something which is shared within the organization it's something which is considered an okay thing to do so if the culture of the organization is to walk in late into the office so the management is walking in at 11 the the managers are walking in at 12 employees will also you know the junior level employees will also take it for granted that we are no we can walk in at any point of time because that is what the culture of the organization is really and we see you know we basically do what we see really and that is what the culture of the organization is if we see that you know um, um uh, not maintaining a good health healthy work life balance is uh, something which is the culture of the organization an acceptable culture of the organization we consider it that it should be an acceptable culture by the organization quickly read through it guys right so if we see that you know uh, it's part of the culture of the organization that everybody stays in late even though the official working hours are 9 to 5 but people are sitting there in the office till 9 pm this is what the culture of the organization this is what is considered an acceptable way by everybody in the organization including the employees the management the top management so why because this is what is considered the culture of the organization now how good and bad that culture is 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 a different ball game altogether that is what is going to define how you know whether you have whether you are prospering uh, a good healthy work life balance in your organization's culture or are your employees deeply and you know they are frustrated from within and they really don't want to stay back in the organization till 9 pm but they are being forced to because everybody else around them is staying back and they are doing their work till late or there is so much pressure of you know work given to them that it's become as a normal normal of the organization right so we need to understand the organization's culture in order to understand what is it that we want to consider as an acceptable or a defined culture what is something that you know is is considered an an acceptable way of operating it should be something which is in line with the overall mission and the vision of the organization 
as well as how strategies get disseminated practices get followed by the organization the work of three academics is assumed knowledge this is something which is coming in from your bt syllabus so for those of you who have gotten an exemption in your bt paper i would request you to please look at and revise these three concepts because it is considered brought forward knowledge as far as your sbl syllabus is concerned is there anybody who doesn't know or understand handy's four cultural stereotypes doesn't understand shine's determinants of cultural organization culture or the hofstede's international perspective is there anybody who doesn't know of these concepts it is assumed knowledge guys something which you should have studied at your bt level or if you've been exempted from this paper you would have studied it as part of your previous qualification is there anybody who doesn't know of these tell me please anand says i am good do got exemption wonderful anand what about others because you would have got a, you know exemption on the basis that you would have studied this separately in another paper that you've got you know coming from what about others so for those of you who have not studied it like kui okay uh, what i would really request you to do kui is just type in this in youtube look at a relevant video on it try to understand it from there because it's considered with uh, you know broad forward knowledge if you are still not satisfied with if you still require my help on it come back to me in the next class and you know we can probably discuss it separately or i really don't know you see that is a thing you know when students come via the exemptions route it becomes really difficult for me to be able to manage the syllabus of sbl because there's so much to be done and if i start getting into things which are considered broad forward i really don't know how on earth will i ever sit finish the syllabus but i'm going to show you very quick videos on this just to very quickly give you a you know a good heads up on it right but short ones please handy's four classes of culture power role task and person In an organization with a power culture, power radiates from just a few individuals, whose influence spreads throughout the organization. This type of culture can be found in small or entrepreneurial organizations, where there are few rules and little bureaucracy. This makes decision making swift. In an organization with role culture, people have clearly delegated authorities within a highly defined structure. Role based cultures are common in bureaucratic organizations for example the government people are highly controlled and follow predetermined procedures without questioning their purpose everyone knows their roles and responsibilities role cultures typically have a tall detailed organizational structure as a consequence decision making may be slow task culture are formed when project based teams are established in an organization these teams are used to address a specific problem and nothing is allowed to get in the way of addressing their goals there is no single power source power shifts depending on the mix and expertise of the team members task culture is suitable for rapidly changing organizations Matrix organizations are an example of task culture. Person culture. In an organization with person culture, individuals see themselves as unique and superior to the organization. The organization simply exists for the individual to work. Common in firms of professionals such as accountants and lawyers, the organization is full of people with similar training, background and expertise. power lies in each group or individual the success of a person culture organization depends on retaining key personnel for more a to z business terminology visit my website if okay 
So that was about the Handy's four cultural stereotypes. I'm going to just show you a very quick one on shines determinants of organization culture as well. I really request you to please spare out some time as part of your homework. Try and go back to these concepts in case you are not thorough with them already. Just going to try and find a good one. Shine's three levels of culture, artifacts, espoused values, and assumptions. Artifacts are an organization's visual structures and business processes. Physical things seen, like the organizational chart, which shows who reports to who, the organization's dress code, office sizes, whether a manager has a personal assistant, and so forth. They give an immediate sense of the organizational's culture. Espoused values are the organization's strategies, goals, and vision. They are the organization's publicly known values. It is how members represent the organization, for example, the mission statement. Basic underlining assumptions and beliefs. These are more difficult to identify as they are embedded taken for granted behaviours which are often on an unconscious level. They are the ultimate source of values and actions for the organisation. For more A to Z business terminology, visit my website. If you found this video helpful, please let me know. Okay, so that was again a very quick recap video of the concept. And I'm just going to show you the next one as well. Just in case you are not done with it, please, please refer to some more videos on YouTube and try and go back to your books on the basis of which you got the exemption to be able to clear your doubts. Okay, so a small one is what I'm looking for. When you write, your tone influences how readers respond. With Grammarly, just highlight your text and type how you want to sound. Get your message right every time. Hi there. When we're looking at organizational culture, particularly in the context of multinational businesses, it's important to consider the different cultures that exist around the world. And the theorist who came up with a model of this was Gert Hofstede. And his theory of national culture. So let's take a quick look at what his theory, his model said. There he is, there's Gert Hofstede, a social psychologist, and he conducted his initial piece of research at IBM, one of the world's first genuinely global operating multinational businesses. He looked at the, uh, the activities, the work ethics and attitudes of over 100,000 employees working for IBM around the world and tried to categorize his finding in terms of different cultures of the different nations where IBM was operating. And he has since expanded this research to come up with six categories that help define national cultures. So let's have a look at the six. They're listed there. I'm going to take you through each for 30 seconds or so. The key thing if you're studying this model is just to be aware of what the six are and how they differ, and potentially to make a link between some of them and other aspects of the course. Let's start with individualism versus collectivism. Uh, collectivism. Here, the issue is that some societies absolutely value the role and performance of individuals over the team, whereas in other societies, other cultures, teamwork, the importance of team is uh, more important than the individual. And of course, this has significant implications for how employees are rewarded. Do you give them financial bonuses, uh, for example, uh, commissions? 
based on how they perform as individuals, or do you set financial rewards up uh, to improve motivation uh, based around team performance? And you can see how a different cultural attitude to team versus individual uh, influences areas like motivational strategy. The second category, and perhaps the most famous category from Hofstadter's research, was what he called the power distance. This is all about the extent to which a culture recognises, encourages either authority and what goes with that, bureaucracy, tall organisational hierarchies, a command and control approach perhaps, compared with a low PD score where the culture would very much encourage flatter organisational structures and much greater uh, emphasis on, on delegation on empowerment or, on, and or autonomy. Perhaps also you might make a link there to decentralised structures, which are also consistent with cultures with a low power distance. The third of Hofstadter's categories is what he called uh, masculinity versus femininity, a slightly unfortunately named category. It's really not about male against females. It's more about the differences in decision making style between different cultures. Uh, Hofstadter described what he called a masculine approach to decision making, fact-based, uh, hard-edged, aggressive, comparing that with what he described as what he called a feminine decision making style, which involves a good deal more consultation, uh, perhaps uh, a, more, a greater emphasis on hunch rather than science and data and a much less aggressive uh, aggressive approach to making decisions. So masculinity versus femininity is really uh, all about the style of decision making in, in an organisation in different national cultures. The fourth one, Hofstede called uncertainty avoidance. And here this is really all about attitude to risk. How, how anxious do managers feel at work, do employees feel at work when they're put in a situation of making decisions? What is their attitude of risk and to what extent do they try to avoid uh, risk and the consequences of getting things wrong? So your low levels of uncertainty avoidance on Hofstede's index would indicate uh, a willingness to accept more risks. We're not too concerned about avoiding uncertainty. Bring it on. Let's embrace risk. Uh, let's embrace change. Perhaps that's suggestive of a more entrepreneurial approach in those countries compared with high levels of uncertainty avoidance, which would suggest uh, less potentially a less entrepreneurial approach. Uh, perhaps uh, structures that emphasize the need for more certainty, less risk taking. Long term orientation was Hofstede's fifth category and this is all about how far you look ahead what's your perspective your time horizon when making business decisions in some countries management teams businesses are run on a very short-termist basis they're focused on next week's sales this quarter's profits has the share price gone up or down today this week and often Financial rewards are based on short-term performance. The the, uh, the salesman who's who's paid or she's paid a commission based on this month's sales, beating next quarter's targets and what have you. Hofstede found that in some countries, and this is still the case, there's much more of a long-term perspective that's taken, uh, and therefore rewards tend to be more geared around long-term performance. A key link to make between long-term short-term orientation is with investment appraisal so if you get a question on investment appraisal and maybe there's, a, there's an opportunity to explore the different cultures that might be uh, relevant to the decisions that are being considered think about whether the culture is more likely to emphasize short-term requirements short-term returns or whether in fact the business is able to take a more long-term perspective on possible returns from investment and lastly, but not leastly, indulgence versus restraint. And here Hofstede identified two different, well, it's a scale, but societies 
which uh, embrace indulgence uh, generally allow a relatively free gratification of human of human fun enjoying life having fun uh, expressing yourself fairly freely whereas so some societies of course are more restrained by their nature therefore he identified a difference there and if you look at Hofstede's work you don't need to know any of this detail but on the Hofstede Centre website there is some data on the relative scores for different countries between the six culture indicators and it's interesting to pick out one or two in terms of their relatively high score compared with others. South Korea seemed to take a very long-term orientation towards uh, the time horizon, the planning for decision, business decision making. Uh, China uh, has a very low level of indulgence, much more likely to want to take a restraint approach. Uh, the USA very much an individualistic culture compared with an emphasis on team. But as I say, you don't need to know that detail, but it's interesting in terms of how different countries and therefore different cultures are defined by Hofstede's culture indicators. And okay, I hope you're good to go ahead. Good to go ahead. Are we good to go ahead, guys? Wonderful. So now we're going to have a look at the concept which is called a cultural web, which basically defines the entire paradigm, which defines the culture within the organization. So you talk about the success stories, what kind of you know stories revolve around in the organization, what are the symbols, the rituals or the routines followed by the organization, what kind of control systems are there in the organization, what is the structure, structure of the organization, as well as the power structures running in the operations. All of that defines the paradigm, the cultural paradigm of the organization. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through these one by one. But before that, what I'm going to do is because it would be boring for you to read through these concepts and, you know, understand it from this perspective. I'm going to show you an example on the cultural web. Let's quickly have a look at a real life example in terms of defining the cultural paradigm, the cultural web in the organization. And then we will go through the theory concept of it as well. Is there a bio break shortly? Uh, yes, there is. Okay, so what I will do, uh, let's take a break now and uh, let's continue with the class at 1 p.m. So there's a short break till 1 p.m. So which means the next 15, 20 minutes are on break. For those of you who are on the different time zones, next 20 minutes is break time. Okay, so I hope everybody's back. Let's quickly have a look at the cultural web. Hello and welcome SBL students. My name is Steve Willis. In this video, I'm going to demystify the cultural web and show you how to use this tricky model in your SBL exam. I'm in an examiner's report. While reviewing the examiner's comments and learning about student performance, I was struck by this comment. Surprisingly few candidates use the cultural web to structure their responses, and so discussions of cultural factors were often partial at best, candidates who used the cultural web as a framework tended to achieve higher marks as there was a clear structure to their answers. In SBL, you might be asked to analyze an organization's culture in the context of change management, for example, new leadership. If you just try to freestyle, 
if you just generate whatever ideas come to mind, you're probably not going to develop enough points to get a pass on that requirement. The cultural web is a great tool to let you drill down into a company's culture and look at a detailed list of factors to help you develop your ideas. Let's jump in. The first aspect of organizational culture we could look at would be power structure. Here we're looking at the source of management's ability to move things forward, to motivate people to take action, to coerce people to do things. Now, power can come from charisma, for example, in a small entrepreneurial company. It's the charisma of the leader that motivates people to take action and move things forward. On the other hand, in a large formal organization, the source of power could be the position in the organization itself. For example, in the army, your power comes from your rank. In some organizations, power can come from an individual's expertise. For example, in a software company that's structured around projects and completing projects, power could come from a software's, software engineer's knowledge, their ability to move the programming project forward. So that's power, and in SBL, you'll find clues about power structure in the pre-scene when they describe the leadership of the company and the board structure. The next dimension of culture that you can explore would be organizational structure, and that's linked to power. Here, we can look at the company's org chart in the pre-scene material. Is the company tall? Are there many levels of management? Or is it flat? Are there fewer levels of management? Is the company structured traditionally around silos like marketing, sales, production, finance? Or do we see a matrix organization? We could then look at how power is distributed through the company under organizational structure. Do we have a centralized company where power is held at the core? Or do we have a more democratic organization with delegation of authority? The next area of culture that we can explore is control and control systems. Here we're looking at the ways in which the company controls staff behavior. I've had jobs where the control environment was quite strict. You'd need a badge to, to enter and exit the building. You'd also need that badge to move around in your own office, to enter different rooms in the office. I'd have lots of paperwork to fill out, timesheets to fill out, material requisition forms to complete, appraisal forms to complete. So some organizations have formal controls, I've also had jobs in more entrepreneurial organizations where control was less formal. We can also look at the emphasis of the control. Is it on punishment or reward? For example, if you're late three times, you go on probation. That would be an example of punishment. On the other hand, we could have a system where bonuses go to the best three performing salespeople. That would be a control system based on reward. So under control systems, we're looking at how a company directs the behavior of their staff. Moving on to rituals and routines. Here we're looking at group activities that happen on a regular recurring basis and what behavior are these routines encouraging? Some rituals that I've personally experienced in companies, budgeting, the budgeting ritual. At the end of the fiscal year, staff are focused on preparing 
the budget for the next year is what we're talking about it's what we're meeting about now if i didn't participate in that boy i would look odd another ritual many of us have experienced would be the annual christmas party here the company is trying to foster team spirit and again if we didn't participate in that ritual we might look a bit odd we would we would look out of place in the company another ritual might be training in some companies and what are the training courses emphasizing what behaviors are the training courses encouraging or what competencies are these courses trying to encourage so these are examples of rituals and routines Another area of organizational culture that we could look at would be the stories that are passed on from employee to employee. And what beliefs do these stories reflect? Do they relate to the strengths of the company? Who are the heroes? Who are the villains in these stories? We could see this in the culture at Apple Computer, the iconic computer company founded in the 1970s by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They had a vision to change the way people work with computers. They wanted computers to be small enough and affordable so people could have them in their, their homes. Well, the trials and the tribulations of the founders of the company, especially Steve Jobs, well, those are still a big part of the culture in Apple Computer today. And the final area of company culture that the cultural web promotes exploring are the company's symbols. In some cultures, like a role culture, the symbols are very prevalent and quite important. For example, in the army, symbols would be your uniform and the stripes on your shoulder. That tells people about your power, about your status in the organization. In a large company, a symbol could be where your office is located. For example, the coveted corner office with two windows in an office building. That would denote someone with a lot of power in the company, senior leadership. I remember my first job as a research assistant on Wall Street. I did not have an office. I had an open cubicle. This told the company that I was low on the totem pole just by the place where I sat. Some organizations might de-emphasize these symbols. For example, you could have a software company where everyone is wearing informal clothing and people work in an open office plan. In fact, you couldn't tell the company founder, the owner of the company, apart from the programmers. This person sits in the same place, they dress the same way, they act the same way. After we've identified and evaluated these aspects of an organization's culture, we can then look at the paradigm. This is the overall way things are done in an organization. How does the company respond to events? And how does a company make strategic decisions? Ladies and gentlemen, that's the cultural web in a nutshell. Please remember, in your SBL exam, you'll get no marks for a generic recital of this model in your answer. You'll only earn credit when you are answering the question that is asked. For example, here in task one, you are asked to prepare briefing notes that outline problems in culture caused by the previous leadership style, and then the impact that the current CEO's leadership style has had on the company's culture. You need a lot of ideas here to get, to get a passing mark on this requirement, so a great starting place would be to lay out the elements of culture defined under the cultural web, those seven elements of culture, that will prompt you to develop your ideas, that'll prompt your thought process as you explore the exhibits, as you recall your knowledge of the pre-scene. SBL team, if you would like to put your knowledge of the cultural web to the test, 
before you jump into the past exams? Well, a great practice activity can be found here in the Study Hub. Under the Cultural Web section, you can find Activity 1. You get a rich description of an organization's culture, and you can then analyze that culture using the Cultural Web. When you are done, you can check your solution against the model answer that is provided. Okay, so that was a very comprehensive by SBL Tutor Guru. And what we're going to do is straight jump into the activity, right? So I want you all to very quickly read through activity one. Remember, just follow the simple techniques which have been told to you. Put down your headers and dig in information from the scenario which is relevant to each of these headers. That's exactly what you're required to do. Just in case. You still don't have the headers on you. Note this down on your word pad, please, very quickly. Note down the headers on your word pad. If you've done with the noting of the word pad document, let's dig into the question and figure out information which is relevant to each of these aspects of the cultural web. Very quickly, read through the activity. Let me know when you want me to scroll down, please. Very quickly, guys, just filter information from the scenario which is relevant to each of the cultural web paradigm that we have just read. Let me know when you want me to scroll down.
done reading guys i want you all to please submit your answers in the chat box so that we can have a good discussion with everyone very quickly submit your answers in the chat box please okay answers pouring in and that's really great so let's very quickly review your answers and also have a look at the model answer which will give us a good idea in terms of what were the more aspects that we could really filter out of this scenario which was given to us under the entire paradigm of the cultural web so what i want you to do is first i want you to review your answers with the help of the model answer so very quickly go through the entire cultural web di di diagram on the screen which talks about the cultural web paradigm
than guys so did it add actually value in terms of what more you could have filtered from the scenario itself under each of these headers of the cultural web believe you me sbl exam is the most easy exam why because everything is literally laid out already on your question paper itself the only thing that you really need to do is hunt for the relevant information under which is you know how it is applicable to each of the different models that you will be applying in the scenario right anything of this that doesn't make sense to you anything that you want me to explain further so if you've been able to understand all of this you can definitely make small paragraphs like this in the answer to explain the answer plan you which you have prepared here right any doubts in this guys anything anybody would like to ask yes please anand please send in your query meanwhile what about everyone else anything anybody would like to ask a uh, good question there anand and it's a very logical question per se so if i look at it if it's a 12 marker question and i've got like literally seven headers to cover you the outline that you must put in your mind is that at least under each of these headers i need to write sufficient enough to be able to get two points each two marks each right and each point how many sentences so don't do not please go on and on and on on writing paragraphs and paragraphs no as long as you've made one solid point so here if i just tell you this just read through this you'll get to know so make a header explain the point you know state a point explain the point move to the next one you do not have to write huge paragraphs you only have to write crisp answers here right okay with everyone <coughs> bear with me let me just grab some water meanwhile go through the model answer please
<laughs> Done reading, guys. Okay with everyone. Okay with everyone, guys. Wonderful. So now let's have a look at how the culture of an organization is going to impact the strategies made by the organization, the strategic decisions made by the organization. That is definitely going to, you know, do you think it is going to impact in the first place? Do you think the culture of the organization impacts the strategy of the organization? Absolutely, yes, right? So what we need to understand here is that we need to foster a culture of growth. We need to foster a culture which has a positive attitude towards the organization so that the organization is able to achieve the mission and vision of the organization in the long run. So the culture of an organization being the entrenched set of beliefs that it has, obviously, either it can, you know, really push the organization and, you know, the organization achieving its strategy or if the culture is not good, it is going to constantly pull you down as well as an organization. So it's very important to understand what the culture you are fostering within the organization. Cultural glue refers to the benefits that culture can have in motivating employees. So it's a fact that, you know, a good culture will foster onto the employees and that will in turn help in achieving the organization's objectives. Captured by a culture means the existing culture may prevent the organization from making bigger strategic changes when required. Why? Because the culture is pulling the organization down because they have been, you know, the culture is something which has been, which is basically capturing you down and not motivating, a, you know, a propelling effect towards the motivation of the employees of the organization. So whatever, you know, whatever new ideas, whatever new things come up as, as an idea, there are conflicts. There are, you know, we, have, we don't want to grow as an organization. We don't want to prosper and explore new ideas. Why? Because the culture of the organization is constantly pulling you down. So definitely an organization needs to make sure that the organization is, is you know, it's fostering good cultural glue and at the same time trying to minimize the impact of the captured culture in the employee. So what you need to do here is motivate good incremental strategic shift and at the same time, make sure that whatever you know ideas and clashes might be arising that get sufficiently and adequately managed by your managers, managed by your team as an organization. So that is when your, you know, your culture as an organization is a prospering culture, is a growing culture. And that is what is going to help strategies being inclined as well. Right? Okay. So now let's quickly have a look at how ethics, do you know, definitely impact the strategy. What are ethics? Any idea? What are ethics? Tell me. Doing the right thing. That is ethics. Doing things which is ethically correct for you to do doing things which are in the benefit of the maximum stakeholders of the organization so which is you know taking a decision which is not just striving a personal agenda of a director but maximum good of maximum number of people considering all the stakeholders to be equal to be fair absolutely right so quickly have a look at an example here. So we the minimum obviously is, you know, uh, what we need to do by law. So we've all heard of the concept of corporate social responsibility, which is the basic minimum that organizations are required to do towards the greater good of the maximum number of people in the society in which we operate. Why? Because we are taking in so much from the environment, from the society, from the community in which we operate. So it becomes your basic duty as an organization to give it back to the organization as well. Quickly read through the example. 
all of these topics we'll be doing in much much detail in separate chapters all together here i am only just introducing the concept to you quickly have a look at the example guys Okay, so now let's have a look at how, as an organization, we can structure ourselves to prosper a good and a healthy organization, to prosper a good and a healthy culture within the organization as well. So it's it's obvious that you know we know that we at the top have the strategic apex of the organization, who is defined by the board of directors of the organization. They are like the top full time operating core of the organization, really. After that, we have two level managers who are going to be your technical staff which is called the techno level staff as well as the operating core of the organization so we have this henry uh, henry mintzberg five components as to what basically what basically is an organization so an organization is considered a mix of these five elements i cannot highlight it here but let me just highlight it here. So you have the strategic apex at the top. Then you have the operating core who is going to take the decisions of the strategic apex forward in order to execute the policies. And then you have the middle line management who is going to be <coughs> like a, a means of communication between your operational staff as well as your operating core and the strategic apex thereafter. Then you have the techno star structure wherein it is directed towards, uh, you know, uh, more of technology driven wherein we can actually standardize a lot of operations. So, you know, a factory setup wherein we have machine power driven structures. That is what is called a techno structure, basically. And everyone else supporting this, this structures within the organization comes under the part of the support structures. So we have different types of organizations per Mintzberg simple structure is obviously where the strategic apex at the top is deciding and everybody else down there is following machine bureaucracy machine bureaucracy is where there's a lot of standardization of work in terms of the machines being able to drive the operations of the organization and the machine being able to drive that uh, that that uh, technological structure within the organization that the product is good because of the good quantum of machines that you've been able to buy and you know put into the system more and more of standardization professional bureaucracy is where the skill set of professionals makes all the difference so if you look at it the uh, hospital is as good as its doctors the uh, you know the uh, the courtroom is as good as the advocates who are you know fighting for the case so what is this? What kind of a structure is this? It's a professional bureaucracy. Divisionalized form is where everybody has been broken down in the form of divisions and everybody knows their part of the total piece of the work that they are doing. So it's a it's lot structured in the form of small business units really. And every business unit has its own KRA and it's working towards achievement its own of its own target. And then you have adocracy, 
wherein we are looking at one project as an ad hoc standalone project, working towards it, making sure that that becomes a success, dropping it and moving it to the next project. Then, so the entire team comes together for full, you know, for successful completion of one team. Once this particular project has been delivered, the team, the core team, gets dismantled, and again there is a new team which gets formed for the new project that you are undertaking. Right? Again, this is something which is a broad forward knowledge. So I'm sure you all know this. Any idea? Any idea, guys? Is uh, like any queries you have from this? Any questions? Any concerns? Anything you want me to explain again? Okay, what about others? I want everybody to answer, please. Okay, so now let's talk about the fact that how we are going to apply these structures and these, you know, these, uh, these uh, application of all of these scenarios to, to real life scenarios, really. So let's quickly have a look at few <coughs> examples, which will tell us that every culture is unique. And thus, managing the culture within the organization is the hugest, you can say, task of the HR team or the HR management. Why? Because they have to constantly deal with any sorts of cultural clash. Quickly have a look at this example of Google and Nest. Quickly have a look at this example of cultural clash. Read through example 9, please.
what about others guys has everybody gone through the example any queries you have from it okay so let's have a look at inappropriate cultures and configurations and what problems will that happen if we are not fostering a good or an appropriate culture per se let's quickly have a look at few examples then you have different stages of the organization life cycle and understand the fact that yes every stage brings in a different cultural aspect as well quickly read through it guys okay so now let's have a look at some of the other you know challenges that culture differences inappropriate culture or in fact for that matter different you know different lifestyle different uh, lifestyle of an organization can also bring into the organization at all times you have to make sure that you are identifying any cultural clashes that you can you know possibly see in the scenario and you are able to identify what is it that you can do to you know resolve this cultural clash how is it that you know you can actually uh, this doesn't seems to be right so you know uh, anybody who's probably uh, like a very good example here given here is looking at you know and excluding female staff because you consider that they are the weaker uh, you know gender or probably they are the lazier gender or they are uh, lesser competent than their male counterparts is certainly something which is inappropriate and certainly if you find if you are able to identify something like this from the scenario given to it immediately you should be able to identify that this is not the appropriate culture which this organization is fostering right again we have a look at the different stages of an organization's life cycle which again are going to change the dynamics of the organization why because under each of these variants under each of these stages the organization's life cycle is going to vary and then we bring along change management within the organization that we are uh, we know we are able to bring across that change how is it that we are able to uh, embrace the change take on the change 
are your you know you as humans we are always a worst change we dislike any change why because wherever we are we are in our comfort zone so any change basically will automatically trigger some sort of you know uh, uh, you can say rebel that no oh, i know i don't want to change why what is the need for change so you should be able to manage this change management process effectively through various styles of change management you know be it communication be it uh, participation be it coercion also sometimes you know you have to like uh, forcefully tell the tell your staff to do certain things certain way or maybe you know educating them maybe discussing it out with them so there are may, many change management techniques which are available which you can make use of in order to foster a good and a healthy change so let's quickly have a look at these different types of changes that are going to be there and how each of these different change is different from each other so let's quickly have a look at first the two paradigms of this this model of change management the different styles of strategic changes that there can be within the organization the first paradigm talks about <coughs> the scope of change how huge the change is is it only a slight realignment to you know from where you are to where you want to be or is it more of a transformation in the sense that you are now fostering a more radical change into the business and the way you are operating so what is the scope of change is it a realignment or is it a transformation everybody okay with the two parameters of the scope of change tell me please are we just realigning to you know to external changes making some sort of little changes or are we doing some sort of a extensive change a more huge a more radical change which is called a transformation so what degree of change are we talking about and then becomes the nature of change which means you're going to be talking about how quickly the change is happening how quickly the change is happening is it something which is developing over time slowly and gradually so it becomes a very incremental you know change however if it is huge it comes with a big bang it comes with that at, at, at a very fast pace it becomes a fast paced big bang change right okay let me just give you a quick moment to read through the example 10 before i open up this strategic change table and we have a look at all of these four different categories of changes that there can be
Okay. Done reading the example, guys. So now let's have a look at the four strategic kind of changes that an organization can undergo during a course of time, slowly and gradually, which is which means that it's an incremental kind of change. But that incremental kind of change is leading to a small, you know, realignment into the business, into the way you're operating, or is that, you know, slowly and gradually totally transforming the way that you operate. So is that change more of an adaptation? So is that change which is happening slowly and gradually, so that incremental change, is that more of an adaptation or is it more of an evolution which is changing the way you operate as a business? Okay. And then again, if a change is happening real time quickly, like a big bang, what kind of change, what kind of repercussion is it bringing across to the business? Is it bringing across a reconstruction of like how you're operating or is it such a huge change that it is completely transforming the way we operate and so huge that it will be called a revolution in itself, right? So these are the four types of changes, strategic changes that can happen in organization depending upon the nature of change. Is it slow? Is it incremental or is it fast paced like a big bang? And the scope of change that this change really brings across. Is it like small realignment or is it bringing across huge transformation strategic change itself? That, that, that table brings across four levels of strategic changes that there can be. Okay with everyone? Is this okay with everyone, guys? Please ask if anybody has any doubt. Okay, I'm just going to give you a quick heads up if I find a good example here. But a quick one. Okay, let's quickly have a look at this one. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Chan from UOW Malaysia KDU. Um, today, I'm going to present to you uh, a topic in the area of strategic change management. Strategic change management is an important syllabus area in the SBR paper of ACCA. The model that we are going to look at today is by Balogun and Hope Hiley. And in this model, the changes that business organization could be experiencing have been categorized into four different types. And um, how do we come about this categorization? So at first, we look at the nature of change, uh, whether such change is incremental. I mean, if it is incremental, it is taking place gradually uh, at a smoother pace. So the business organization will have time to respond to it accordingly. And whereas if the change is a big bang, then obviously from the word itself, you can imagine that such a change is a shock, is unexpected. And then the speed that the, that the change is coming to you is also giving you tremendous pressure when it is a big bang. Okay. And then whereas another perspective of looking at the change is by looking at the scope of the change, uh, whether such change is resulting realignment required. So if the organization were to do realignment, then the organization will have to do some changes, some adjustment, um, some fine tuning to the existing practice. Uh, whereas if a transformation is uh, involved, then of course the context of change is much more uh, you know, greater 
uh, we could be touching the fundamental, we could be touching the, the a region of the business model. And this is a uh, transformation. All right, I, I'll try to give you one example for each, uh, and so that it helps you to understand better and easier. Uh, adaptation, as, as many of us can, uh, can observe in our business environment after COVID-19 or during COVID-19, as you can see, many businesses started to adapt to the new norms of uh, running their business. Yeah? So how do you manage the crowd of the customers who visit your business premises? How do you maintain the high standard of hygiene uh, you know, for those who uh, come to your shops? You know, or how do you take down the temperature of the customers? Yeah? So all these are new norms that the business will have to adapt to. And then the second one is reconstruction. Yeah? As uh, everyone can imagine you, or you can observe, you can read from the newspaper in the past few months, the tremendous pressure that uh, the COVID-19 has brought to the business world. You know, whether, whether the business is big or small or medium, you, know, you, you, you suffer tremendous cost pressure uh, because many of the cities are, are having this lockdown policy. So uh, businesses are not allowed to open as usual. So in this context, you know, many organizations will have to think about ways to minimize their fixed costs. So you have to reconstruct your business model so that fixed cost is minimized. And whereas for, for evolution, the, the good example for evolution uh, during this uh, COVID-19 period would be as you can see, many organization, business organization, even the traditional one, they already seriously venture into uh, doing e-business, you know, uh, bringing their business online. Because you have to, because uh, the, the traditional way for customers to approach you is no longer available, especially during the lockdown period. So you have to allow the customers to reach the business to transact with you online. So this is a good example for evolution. And whereas for the last one, revolution, uh, I, I would be reluctant to conclude whether a revolution has taken place huh? uh, in the business world uh, during this COVID-19 period, because I think uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, when the incident is over, when the whole crisis is over, only then we are in a better position to see and to... Absolutely right. Any queries, guys? Any doubts you have? Any doubts, guys, please ask. Because now we're going to have a look at different styles of being able to lead your organization. Different leadership styles in which you are going to, you know, either uh, collaborate or probably, you know, use the force of power or educate your people to, you know, come along and participate with you. Or probably, you know, sometimes where intervention is also very important or sometimes where just, you know, we just need to like direct our team in terms of how and what needs to be done. So JSW, that is Johnson Scholes in Whittington, they have identified five leadership styles that can be used to manage strategic change. So let me just tell you regarding these five styles. So education and communication obviously means that you want to bring in a change in your organization. But for that, the top management is looking to educate and communicate the staff at large, the team at large, as to why we are thinking of making this change. So we are basically giving in a lot of you know, information to bring down that reluctance to change. So a lot of education, a lot of communication will help them, you know, resolve all their apprehensions towards the change slowly and gradually. Up next is the collaboration or participation, which simply means we're going to, you know, as, as partners, as individuals, we're going to collaborate together, join hand in hand, and together we're going to foster this change to come across. Intervention simply means that you are delegating, you know, as and when changes need to be done, how this change need to be done and you are intervening when things go, when, when things are not working on track. Direction simply means that you are giving 
your uh, your employees your staff you know clear instructions clear strategy that this is what needs to be done when and how bang on then there could be you know we are not explaining we are not collaborating we are not participating but we are using the force the power that we have as management and making use of coercion that is power to uh, to uh, you know uh, enforce on our teams on our uh, staff to do roles and to do uh, you know a um, certain to adapt to the change without you know uh, considering whether they are willing for that change without even resolving their apprehensions without even get giving them an opportunity to collaborate to discuss that is just purely use of power now obviously we all know as you know these different styles they will have their own sets of advantages as well as disadvantages as well so we're going to propel a change agent who is going to bring across this huge strategic change that you are thinking about now quickly i want you to go through this table first please the different styles what it means the benefits the problems it brings across and which one is most effective when so read through this first and then i will scroll down it's very very self explanatory so you should all be able to understand you know when uh, what it basically means what apparent benefits it brings across and when it should be utilized by the organization as well Can reading guys please ask if you have any doubts in any of these leadership styles i've explained them all but please ask if you have any doubts in this all the five different leadership styles you should be able to identify what it means what are the apparent advantages and disadvantages of each of these styles and obviously which one is most suitable at what point of time why because you could be you know uh, in the question you could be asked to identify the leadership style being used and if it's not the best style which one do you really recommend the organization to use so you know from that perspective you should be able to identify these leadership styles quickly read through guys ask if you have any doubts here i'm going to show you a quick example on these leadership styles very quickly i'm going to show you quick example this is nice leaders exercise their authority let me just show you this quick video here pretty in a variety of different ways the way that leaders choose to show their power and authority is described as a leadership style leadership styles relate to the way that a leader behaves and the way that the functions of leadership are carried out first up there is democratic leadership this is a type of leadership style in which members of the group are involved in the decision making process an example so you can say your uh, participation education you know bringing them along as collaborative definitely would be a more democratic leadership style example of this is allowing employees to vote on decisions that are being made there are many advantages of democratic leadership 
such as employees being better prepared for a promotion because they have already had to make harder decisions. As well as this, employees are more able to accept changes within the organization, as they are aware of why changes are being made, due to being involved in the decision-making process. Some of the disadvantages of democratic leadership include issues, like the time it may take for a decision to be made, or that a strong leader is often needed to lead a discussion between staff members, so that there is clear communication of ideas. Next up is autocratic leadership, also known as authoritarian leadership, which is a leadership style, where one person has control over all decisions and where there is little input from group members. Autocratic leaders typically make choices based on their ideas and judgments and rarely accept advice from employees in the organization. Some of the advantages of autocratic leadership styles include that decisions can be made quickly due to managers making all the decisions. As well as this, employees have clear instructions on what needs to be done and the requirements needed, which can improve efficiency within the business. Some of the disadvantages of autocratic leadership include issues, such as employees' creativity and ideas being ignored, as well as this, employees may start to feel demotivated because they are not getting to share their ideas or take on any responsibility. Lastly, there is laissez-faire leadership, also known as delegative leadership is a type of leadership style in which leaders are hands-off and allow group members to make the decisions. Researchers have found that this is generally the leadership style that leads to the lowest productivity among employees and is often ineffective. Some of the advantages of laissez-faire leadership are that employees are likely to feel empowered and motivated by the responsibility being given to them. As well as this, it increases the chances of innovation if employees feel confident and are not being micromanaged. Some of the disadvantages of laissez-faire leadership include issues, such as employees feeling under pressure, if they are not being supported when having to make important decisions. This often leads to employees feeling demotivated and stressed. As well as this, it may not be clear who is responsible, which could lead to a decision not being made. You might ask, which leadership style is the most effective? This answer usually depends on the type of business. For example, a business that is trying to survive and needs to make quick decisions is likely to need an autocratic leader. However, a lot of businesses are moving towards a more democratic approach to leadership. This is due to increased competition in most industries, meaning that businesses need to be innovative when making key decisions. I hope this has been helpful. Please subscribe for more business. Okay, so were you able to identify these different leadership styles under these styles? Any doubts, guys? Anything you want to ask? Anything you want to ask, guys? Because we've finished off this chapter. I'm going to open up the quiz for you now. Any doubts? Quickly go through the summary. Wonderful. So let's quickly open up the quiz for the chapter. Very quickly, I want everybody to give answers, please. Quickly give answers. So what is an organization's vision? We did that in the chapter, right? I want everybody to answer, guys. Because I will go by the majority of your answers because only then I will know whether you've been able to understand the crux of the chapter or not. Okay, C says the common answer. Next question, which of the following is most important for an effective leader? Very quickly.
what is most important for an effective leader i will just say i will just choose the option which the majority says okay i seems to be getting b as the most common answer okay next which of the following is the responsibility or skill that is required by an entrepreneur but is not required by an intrapreneur that's a good question so what is required by but by an intrapreneur but doesn't is not required by an intrapreneur it's none of the business of the intrapreneur really ability to raise funds is the common answer next question guys benefits of effective entrepreneurship tell me what are the what is the following is the effective benefit of effective entrepreneurship which one is it d is d the option that you are saying okay then last question on your screen which aspect of the cultural web model represents the set of assumptions and collective experience of the organization very quickly which one was it the cultural paradigm okay mm -hmm. let's check your answers then and that's a 100% correct quiz well done guys any doubts anybody wants me to explain any of these questions any doubts guys please feel free to ask any doubts guys okay then um, i have not given you a lunch break today because i wanted to wind up the session earlier than usual instead of breaking it in between so that may, uh, brings us to an end of today's session and uh, thank you so much everyone for joining in and responding and you know doing well in the class what you need to do now is open up this practice part and start off with the practice of your questions as well so all of this is something that you know you have to do simultaneously open up your uh, chapters and finish off the practical questions which are there with respect to each of these chapters so open up your bpp practice and revision kits and they, it is basically broken down into chapters as well let me just show it to you what all questions you can cover here okay so these are the technical this is where you need to click here practice the questions taken related to this topic do this as part of your homework please everyone and also the same topic you can open up your bpp practice and revision kits and do the questions which are pertaining to the same topic from your bpp kits as well all of this simultaneous question practice is extremely important for you to be able to pass your sdl paper and so from the first chapter itself you have to do this right please make sure that you are you know diligent in your studies from the very first weekend of the classes because syllabus is huge and we really really need to be on our toes from the first weekend only so that we are simultaneously covering up question practice and other things which are required to revise the concepts as we are going with the topics as well okay then i hope everybody is clear with the homework that they have to do before we meet uh, the next in the next class okay then thank you so much everyone thank you bye bye